I teach in a very unusual way and I have for the past two decades and it gets a lot of questions because it's very unlike what other people are doing and I want to explain where it comes from, why it's fundamentally better, in addition to why honestly it's probably a better match going forward for the future of why it's better for remote education, it's better for internet and technology enabled education, it's just better for the way that the world is shaped compared to what was the best answer a century ago. Now where this actually begins for me despite me saying that this is like the future phasing is actually playing Bubble Bobble as a child with my older brother. Bubble Bobble was this game released in 1986, at least for the arcades. The uh, NES cart might have been a year or two later. I don't know, I was still a child. And this game went on to get many sequels. Rainbow Island, a uh, variety of confusing. There's multiple things kind of called three. It's sort of an unclear timeline. The important point is I kept following MTJ's career. MTJ is the English acronym used for his name. I don't trust my syllable pronunciation of Japanese to try to say his actual name, but this is his name and he was the lead designer for Bubble Bobble and a variety of other games, he took an educational path later in his career. And in particular, around the time that I was getting out of college is when he passed away. So he lived from 1960 to 2008. So he was 25 years old when Bubble Bobble get made. And then by the time he passed away, he was 48. But we can still find through the Wayback Machine the website that he had for his game design school. And it's a very, very different kind of game design school. And obviously, as you might have guessed, because I wasn't even careful trying to say his name, I can't read Japanese, but what I can do is I can use Google Translate. And so feeding sections of his website into Google Translate at the time, it was much harder back when I was first doing this because WordLens wasn't established yet. I was able to find a way to do it. And basically, right, so this is from MTJ's website for his game design school in 2008. 2008. Before massively learning, what are those things called? Uh, MOOCs, right? Before that was happening for Udemy. Back in 2008, his website said, why do tuitions have to be so high for game schools up until now? Because his school is the exception. And he established that tuitions for most schools are actually paying largely. They're not paying for your professors. They're not paying for better educators. They're paying for advertising cost. They're paying for land building, for the building land that it goes on, the real estate, brochure fees, computer fees, all this other kind of machinery and stuff. It's money that's not yours. You're not keeping what the stuff is. And so here he's kind of like this great diagram. And this is straight. You'll see it's straight from on his website. And actually, when I first looked at this, I used to think that was a building, which is maybe just him being a design genius. Of course, that's a stack of cash. But it used to go towards electricity, gas, water, moving, telephone, meals, transportation expenses, two or three million. Now, obviously, that's a different unit of money, the currency that we have in the United States. In contrast to why, with MTJ's approach, you can save money, right? On savings, on car driving, on license, an overseas trip, etc. It just has to cost so much less. And this is actually something that tapped into as I can do to be an educator, realizing that there's a more efficient way to run teaching that doesn't have nearly as high overhead for the students. Now, one of the challenges I've run into is because I can and I do charge significantly less than traditional educational pathways, people assume from that, they infer that, oh, this is cheaper, oh, this is worse. This is not as good. And deeply, that's not what's going on. Because what this enables it to do is you can actually get, in some cases, even better paying per hour experts, professionals, people who are good for an educational lens, people who are actually good teachers who have relevant experience and have experience explaining to others how to do this stuff from the money you're not spending on gardening the area around the football stadium and the rest of physical infrastructure. Now, we know we had a big hang-up not too many years ago, obviously, from COVID forcing a lot of schools online badly, and that was because they were still trying to adapt a model that was fundamentally built around 30 people in a room being talked to, maybe 300 room being talked to by one person, and that is where, in my case, I've also done a lot of years of reading about educational philosophy from a variety of sources. And that's what I'm going to tap into here because this is part of where it, it wasn't an immediate thing, right? I still went off to work at EA. I still helped start PopCap San Francisco. Still did R&D for World Rights. Still bounced around in different things and made educational games and talked to GDC and all kinds of other industry stuff before I found my way back to doing this mainly. And around the same time, I was still running another game development club on the side that was a similar pattern to my first one. 2004, I started the first. 2010, I started the second one. And around the time I started to realize that people were getting better results out of being alumni from our clubs than they did from the classrooms. Now, classrooms are valuable. I'm not saying that's useless information, but it's often antiquated. It's often out of touch with the practical practice. It's often a case where even if you excel at it, what's really preparing you for, and this is unfortunately still a reality for a lot of people, is to pass that stupid whiteboard interview where they're asking you questions about how do you balance these trees and how would you hand code a linked list? And well, if it was 1979, here's how I would do that. For everybody else, we're using STL or built-in libraries or the built-in list in Unity, and we're looking at a high-level abstraction of why are you doing that? Of what does this fit into a bigger picture of what's going on? And the number of seats that actually knew about stuff like O of N notation are increasingly pretty slim in the marketplace. Anyway, let me drag us back to where 
We're going to come from philosophy back towards this practical foundation again. People who are coming out of these groups are getting better results in their careers, in their interviews, in their practical skills, in their learning, in their growth, in their portfolios than they were from the classrooms. But this is really a foundation for why. In fact, it has nothing to do with me. I sort of lucked and stumbled into that and we're finding an intersection of that and what MTJ had been doing since 2008 when he was passing away. So this is a Bertrand Russell book. This might have been, I think, the early 1900s, maybe, uh, yeah, early early half of the 1900s, right? So this is why instead of giving lectures, I have students choose projects and tasks, and then I meet with them every week or two. And this is a very directly, that's the formula that I use in Home Team Game Dev. It's the formula that I used when I was running these college clubs. I got better at it. In the newer universities in England and America, there's regrettably there's a regrettable tendency to insist upon attendance at innumerable lectures. When I was an undergraduate, my feeling, and that of most of my friends, was that lectures were a pure waste of time. No doubt we exaggerated, but not much. The real reason for lectures is that they are obvious work, and therefore businessmen are willing to pay for them. If university teachers adopted the best methods, businessmen would think them idle and insist upon cutting down their staff. He should see the pupils individually when they have done their papers, about once a week or once a fortnight. He should see such as care to come in the evening and have desultory conversation about matters more or less connected to their work. All this is not very different from the practice at the older universities. If a pupil chooses to set himself a paper different from that which teacher, but it's equally difficult, he shall be at liberty to do so. Let them choose their assignments. Let them work independently. Come to you once every week or two with questions to have a conversation about it. For those of you who've had the fortune and privilege in life, like I have to go to graduate school, this is closer to what you do as a PhD student. This is closer to what, when you're near the end of your time in a master's program is what's happening. In the undergrad system, where it's typically 300 or 30 people in a room, they basically be putting play on a movie in front of you or pushing play on a YouTube video from the level of it's someone talking at a crowd, and that is fundamentally not where most of this learning is going on. Now, I want to be clear, this can sound anti-intellectual. It's not for me, right? Again, I started a PhD before I pivoted out of that system, but I respect academia, I respect the learning, I respect the tradition, I respect all of those things, journal system, and so on. Bertrand Russell, you couldn't get more intellectual than Bertrand Russell, right? Guy wrote History of Western Philosophy solve some pretty significant things in maths that I'm not even bright enough to be able to explain succinctly or maybe even wrap my head fully around, even if I get kind of the high-level gist because of the comp sci education, which, again, I got through university. Not saying it has no place. I'm saying that there is a different and better way to learn maybe even certain kinds of things. Now, again, because he did this over a century ago when he wrote this, or at least approximately a century ago, it was still a very different world. If you think about what would someone do in that week or two between papers, I guess they're poring over books in the library. But it's much harder then than it is today for someone to go out of their way to learn what they can through technology online. How much of the learning now in a classroom, if we're real with ourselves, maybe it used to have to come from what the teacher explained. Increasingly, we go to the classes, and this was even my experience, honestly, in 2007, not to diminish the professors there. Again, they're smart, good people. I don't fault them at all. But what happened was the professors would talk. I'd feel overwhelmed. I couldn't keep up. I'd try to take constant notes. I just couldn't follow or untangle it. I would go back to my room and look up on the internet how to understand what the hell is going on. And that was how I learned, by looking up on my own, because I had assignments I had to do because I was forced to figure it out. But I was able to figure it out through the outside resources of the Internet, which we can take for granted now through videos and tutorials and examples and sample code. So much we can figure out. Now, it's still helpful to have an expert or a professor to turn to. And this is why many people's favorite experience when I talked to I've interviewed hundreds of game warpers, literally over 200 game warpers over the years between IGDLA chair running those events, between Indicates alumni person running those uh, E3, doing those interviews live on the stage floor, all this kind of stuff by podcast for since summer 2015, consistently interviewing lots of game developers. And well, almost without exception, if they went to grad school for games or a game school, their favorite experience was typically the class that said, more or less, your game is due at the end of November. Here are your teams or get on teams. If you have questions, come talk to me. You know how to find me. And that sounds lazy. That sounds like a mushroom could do it. But you actually need a lot of horsepower from that faculty member who has the experience to grasp your context and understand you as people and figure out for your project that you're doing, this is the ways around the design problem you're encountering. This is the production way to untangle the thing. This is for the unique technical problem you're running into because it's different than it was for these other 30 students. For the problem you're running into, here's an untangle. That's a very hard thing to do. That's more of what I do. But that is where increasingly to leverage the power of the outside technology, we're leaning on it anyway. We're just pretending like what's said in front of the classroom is still where the horsepower and action is happening for so many people. Again, there are useful nuggets there. There are good lecturers. There are smart people. This is not negative of any of that. This is about what happens for me as a person on the learning side of the experience. And for me, so many people, it is that stuff slides right off of us. It's not how we're good at receiving it, sitting in a lecture. We need to go do something with it. And this is also where, in all acknowledge, maybe a slight privilege in the area of technology and game programming, especially. 
or even to extent game design and maybe to some extent to music or art. They're things that when it's not working, we can tell, right? We can tell that it's not working. So we can try again. And this is what enables us in our own time. It's why there's so many self-taught programmers is because you can just try a thing and be like, is it doing? No, it's broken. Okay, well, I can work on that. I can bounce back and forth. And this is where, and again, I'm saying there's room in the system. If you're going into medicine, if you're going into law, if you're, hell, if you're writing poetry, it's much harder to tell, is my poem working? It's much harder to tell, would this prescription kill someone if I don't know the circumstances of their health condition? That's a much more complex and different kind of problem than I tried to write some code. Does it run? No, I got to go make changes. I got to poke it some more. That's an artifact again of the world as it exists in 2024 that it didn't when Bertrand Russell wrote this in Education and the Good Life. Let's go to another quote because I could talk about Bertrand Russell all day and why that's a factor in how I do what I do and the way I do it. Alfie Cohn, famous modern educator in educational philosophy, love his views. This is why instead of exercises and quizzes, right, I don't do assignments and all that kind of junk. Doesn't fit what I teach and the way I teach. And again, might fit something else. Might be a great topic for vocabulary words in Spanish. It's not the kind of thing that I teach. I teach projects as an applied practical way to do things. Why I emphasize solving problems in the context of real teams. So Alfie Cohn says, in a word, learning is decontextualized. Here he's being critical of the usual way in which learning is siloed into specific class subjects. We break ideas down into tiny pieces that bear no relation to the whole. We give students a brick of information followed by another brick, followed by another brick, until they are graduated, at which point we assume they have a house. What they have is a pile of bricks, and they don't have it for long. More and more teachers are coming to recognize that excellence is most likely to result from well-functioning teams, in which resources are shared, skills and knowledge are exchanged, and each participant is encouraged and helped to do their best. Right? So recognize, again, this is super different than assignment. Let me be clear, too, that many teachers know this. Out of, you talk to a bunch of teachers, about, they'll know who Alfie Cohn is. A lot of them would love to do what Alfie Cohn talks about. Administrative, faculty, bureaucratic strictures and things won't let them. Now, the systematic reasons, I don't even necessarily blame those people. They're responsible to state standardized testing that they will, they can't teach that way because that's not how the SATs are going to score it. And if they don't get good in the SATs and we can't keep our jobs and they can't go to college and all of that is true, it is part of the knot that has been so hard to untangle for a century. But Alfie Cohn is not afraid to say that that is not the best way to learn, preparing for the SATs in brick by brick as opposed to teams and context in real actual problems. This is part of why it's been so much more helpful to our students when they're working on things, whether it's in my clubs I started in undergrad or in grad school or in my current group for home team game, ever released almost 200 games in the past eight years, where instead what's happening is they find an actual project that interests them. It has context, it has teammates, it has people to communicate with. And this is where, again, so in the case of, as Bertrand Russell said, if a people chooses to set himself a paper different from that teacher, but equally difficult, he should be at liberty to do so. If they have the freedom to choose... They can be more motivated about it. They can pick a thing that actually taps into their interest, taps into their motivation. This is what is also different from the brick. It's hard to get excited about a brick. It's easier to get excited about a house, right? We don't want to write a paper, we want to write a book. And I know that there's steps in between. And again, like smaller, especially, I don't mean to put this on elementary grade teachers, et cetera. That's a different world. I'm talking when you start getting older into high school, especially collegiate, especially into adult, that it needs to be a practical thing. And this is part of why when I went back to grad school, part of why I did, I had been doing pretty successfully making games for entertainment. And I felt like I wanted to make games for learning. I wanted to help human cognition and transmission of ideas. And I was interested in all of that. Games for journalism, games for science. And so what I did was I was working in labs, multiple labs, for these long, several month, sometimes multi-year projects about communicating across some idea about politics or philosophy or neuroscience or how improv theater people act and think. And I figured out that along the same time, we would test those with people and they'd be very confused about this complicated nebulous system they're poking and experiencing and trying to play with. And at the end, it would be easier for us to tell them what we're trying to say to them. It wasn't the right vehicle to deliver that idea. At the same time, I had started another college game development club at Georgia Tech like I had at Carnegie Mellon because, again, I'd been hearing the alumni from the first club were doing pretty well in industry. They were getting jobs they wanted. They were having the skills they wanted. They're making games. They're making connections. Some of them found spouses through it. It was a great environment for people to socialize and learn and grow and express themselves, whether or not they were in comp sci or some of the field. It worked out well for them. So I wanted that at Georgia Tech. Started on the side. It's almost as an afterthought based on sitting down at lunch one day with somebody. I was like, oh, yeah, I ran a club like this at Carnegie Mellon. He's like, do you want that here? I said, sure, let's start it. So I started one like that at Georgia Tech. While I'm focusing on those labs, trying to make things that help people learn that are games trying to throw ideas at them more like a game as a lecture, I realized that out of this club I had started on the side, which was easy for me to run because it's what I had done six years prior at Carnegie Mellon for several years. What was happening was people were staying up late on their own volition, studying trigonometry to make their cars do cooler slides. 
They were working on learning better applications of vector math to get their homing missiles to hit their targets. They were working on creative skills. They were working on together figuring out how to practically pack assets, models, animations, music, sound effects, long-term schedule planning, teamwork coordination, overcoming for some of them, and this was me too, in certain stages of my career, our social hangups to better collaborate with others in ways that open up all these other areas of our life, in ways that serve us so much better. But the reason why they did that was, remember, there was no grade for those things. There were club projects. There was no grade. There was no score. There was no points. They cared about the outcome. They wanted it to appear good. And so for the reason I'm actually going to skip ahead now, I'm going to come back in my order of these things. This one's a little bit of an odd one because it's actually from the introduction to the educational writings of John Locke. This is John William Anderson, himself not a famous philosopher, but he has this pointed statement that I love that is at the core and heart of what I teach and how I teach and why I teach it. Not amusement nor distraction, but the desire to affect some cherished purpose is the strongest motive that can move the learner. There's a lot packed in that sentence. I want to say it one more time. And it's all not very long, right? Not amusement nor distraction, but the desire to affect some cherished purpose is the strongest motive that can move the learner. I think I'm going to mention already. When I started that podcast back in summer 2015, the very first interview I had, I've now interviewed like say hundreds of game developers over the years. The very first interview I had for a podcast was a teenager. I literally got his parents' permission to make sure it was okay for me to record and rebroadcast this episode. And this teenager had learned programming because he wanted to modify Minecraft. He wanted Minecraft to have spells and particles and things it didn't have at the time. He had a cherished purpose. That was the motive that drove him to learn programming. And honestly, that's also what got me into programming. I wanted to be able to modify and do things to doom and to quake and to dissent. I wanted to be able to realize my ideas on the screen. And when the gap between me and doing that was to learn these skills, then I learned those skills without regard for where is this in the curriculum? Without regard for when is this going to become my job? Without regard for how is this going to pay me back? Without regard for anything besides I want what is on the other side of me figuring out how to do this. And again, for doing this, it requires that you're working on projects that matter to you. You're working on a house, not on bricks. And this is where when students talk about the frustration of why are we learning this is because they legitimately don't know. And the way that things get taught, and again, I'm not faulting. I know it's going to sound like I am. I'm not faulting teachers, not faulting the system at play. I get, I see, I've lived in, I've worked in, I've been a subject to. And good friends who are smart, good people in that system. And I know why and how it's so hard to change it from the way that it is. And again, plenty of teachers even know better and would scream Alfie Cohen from the top of the hill if somebody would let him. But it's why when you're doing isolated worksheets and challenges, it's why when someone learns trigonometry, I was talking about online the other day with somebody, I work with people when learning how to use trigonometry to do things in games, practical things, or the distance formula to do practical things. And I'll have smart people who did good in math class who will actually ask me questions like, okay, but, but when does anyone use the Pythagorean theorem? And I'm like, well, one answer is to figure out if you're close enough to power up to get it. Right? Or someone might ask, okay, well, when and how and why does you ever use, do you solve for X in the tri trigonometry stuff? And you don't really solve for X. That's not what we do with it, right? We use it to take an action and a speed and make sure that it's happening at a normalized vector. So when it's going at an angle, it's not going faster. And those are things that come up in game programs that are very practical. But what I find is even if someone was good at those math classes, when I'm teaching them how to apply it in a practical way, it's completely foreign to them. Totally new because it's not what they were graded on. Because they were graded on a brick. They weren't doing it as a part of a house. They didn't have a cherished purpose to, de to a desire to do it to need to gain that skill to overcome, to do something. Let's go back to some other quotes here. Henry David Thoreau, which I don't know if you have probably mentioned before on this channel, Walden's a big deal for me. Uh, I made an indie game about it back in 2009, extremely influential for my own path in life. And I want to clarify, some people when they hear Walden and Henry David Thoreau, they get the wrong idea. And it's a little bit like this confusion about, if you know Sinclair is the jungle, people's naive impression of the jungle is that Sinclair, this is obviously a different book, they think it's about animal rights. They think it's about being why you should be vegetarian. And granted, yes, it talks about slaughterhouses. But really, it's about workers' rights, right? It's about the people who are the wage laborers and the danger and the difficulties and the unfairness and the brutality of how life is on those people versus the people that it's enriching. It is about people, not about the animals. Now, in the same way, Walden, a lot of people misunderstand this very... And, you know, I don't fault whoever for how it was taught to them and what they were exposed to. And if they were forced to do it for SITs, they probably got it the wrong lens on it. People think it's some survivalist nonsense like a survivor living out in the woods alone is the whole point. It's super not. If you actually read the book as a grown-up, what you'll figure out is that most sections of it are really pretty clear about what it's about is instead of overworking himself for a bunch of busy work that own and buy things he doesn't need, asking himself, how little do I actually need to live? 
how little do I actually need to earn in order to sustain myself and be able to devote the remainder of my time and energy and attention to things that interest me. Now, in the case of Henry David Thoreau, it was nature, it was the pond. And even here, again, people think because he was a you know, transcendentalist, people will think about, oh, he's kind of this weird spiritualist, listen to the birds sing. He's a very empirical, smart person. So one of the things that he did around the time, people honestly thought that Walden Pond might be infinitely deep. It's a, it's, it's based on, it's from a glacier foundation. So it's deeper than a lot of other things. I think Kettle Hole might be what they're called. Ice long ago sank it very, very deep in the middle. People didn't have great ways to check. And so the, some legitimately smart people at the time just thought that it was infinitely deep. So what he did was he went out in the middle of this pond with his boat and a rope and knots around it, lowered it into it, measured the depths at various locations and figured out it's not infinitely deep. He took the time to explore it. Now he was able to do it because again, he prioritized what lets him live the life he wants and explore his interests and answer questions versus all the busybodies who were over in Boston while he was in Concord. All the busybodies who were worrying about how to afford newer, nicer, fancier furniture and accumulating bigger, nicer, fancier homes instead of worrying about what actually interests me. Why am I doing anything? Anywho, Henry David Thoreau's Walden, that's what this comes from. And I always said that because I feel like I got to defend it because people have the wrong lens. They think it's about some like, oh, Jill, you know, his mom did his laundry. Yes. It turns out most people when they're writing have some sort of spouse or family also helping support that they're also writing a book on top of doing this thing that they're doing. Again, it's not fundamentally a isolated hermit story. That's a misunderstanding for seventh graders who don't know what they're talking about. Now, to borrow this quote from Henry David Thoreau Walden connected to why I would teach the way that I teach, expense of getting an education would in great measure vanish. Those conveniences what the student requires at Cambridge or elsewhere cost him or somebody else 10 times as great a sacrifice of life. Those things for which the most money are demanded are never the things which the student most wants. Tuition, for instance, is an important item in the term bill, while for the far more valuable education which he gets by associating with those cultivated contemporaries, no charge is made. You're paying the institution, it's going towards the institution, not towards the real values, probably your classmates. That was certainly the case for me. Part of the value of these clubs I started was the classmates coming up together. But I'll continue. Says one, you do not mean that the students should go to work with their hands instead of their heads? I do not mean that exactly, but I mean something which he might think a good deal like that. Which would have advanced the most at the end of a month? The boy who had made his own jackknife from the ore which he had dug and smelted, reading as much as would be necessary for this or the boy who had attended the lectures on metallurgy at the Institute in the meanwhile and had received a Rogers penknife from his father, which would be more likely to cut his fingers. And this is where, and again, I, I worry sometimes when I run, I don't want me rant more about this stuff because I don't want to sound anti-intellectual. Clearly, reading a bunch of philosopher quotes and old English quotes, these are important things to me. Reading as much as would be necessary for this. He's not saying don't read. He's not saying figure out for yourself. He's saying, Find a practical thing you're trying to do and then learn what you need to learn to understand to do it. And this is the same thing I do in game voting. I'm not saying don't watch talks. What I am saying is people who spend years watching 500 talks on YouTube aren't any better off for it. If instead there's an actual project you are trying to solve and you find there's a talk and a page and some examples that help you understand conceptually how to tackle the actual problem you're up against, then you're really learning something. That's when and how you learn. That's also why, again, when I'm talking about this thing where I use this Russell model of I meet with people once every other week if they want to, right? And again, this is their, where is this? Once or twice a fortnight. He should see such as care to come in the evening. It's optional. I don't force them. I'm not grading them to do this. I'm saying you can and those who do get the benefit of it and their team's benefit because someone else's team's getting benefit of it. But talking about that means that they have solving a real problem. They run into a real challenge. They're scheduling time with me to teach them, giving them a lesson in the context of your project that you care about, that you're trying to do something with, and that is real learning, unlike exercises and assignments and essays and stuff. Just two more, and then we'll kind of wrap this up. Henry O. Roger III and Mark A. Daniels' Make It Stick. It's a modern book. Not like some of these others. Learning is deeper and more durable when it's effortful. Periodic practice arrests forgetting, strengthens retrieval routes, and is essential for hanging on to the knowledge you want to gain. When you space out practice at a task and get a little rusty between sessions, you interleave the practice of two or more subjects. Retrieval is harder and feels less productive, but the effort produces longer lasting learning and enables more versatile applications in later settings. This is why, even though it's lower intensity, some people will see this like it's a boot camp, right? Two to three months, super intensive, come in and just slam 24 hours, five days a week, in and out. Doesn't that sound nice? It doesn't stick. It's not as good of a way to learn it. Then as interleaving over time, practice alongside other things in a sustainable balance. This is why the things that I do teach people to gain developers for a lifetime. 
as opposed to foundations that might be very quickly how to use a tool, but not what to do with it. And to pin a pin on that, it's a little bit different at this point. It's this classic problem you might never be talked about before on this channel about if you wanted to learn to be a writer and you took a class on how to write, and what they did was they taught you what the menus do in Microsoft Word, you figured that was a waste of your time because you wanted to figure out about how and why to plan and what to write and how to phrase and how to develop characters and plot and so on. They're teaching you how to use the tool, not what to do with it. That is, again, you'll see a lot of that in the game to open space about how to use Unity instead of what are you doing with Unity? How is it achieving your goals and your purpose? And it fits into what you're doing. One last quote I want to draw from, though, here. Mihai, chick minch hi. Flow. This is a famous one in game literature. I still literally just last semester was teaching Northeastern. Had a student who cited this incorrectly to some other book that cited Flow. Anyone referring to Flow is probably referring to Mihai's work. So let's look at the actual uh, quote here from the source of Flow. To overcome the anxieties and depressions of contemporary life, individuals must become independent of the social environment to the degree that they no longer respond exclusively in terms of its rewards or punishments. To achieve such autonomy, a person has to learn to provide rewards to herself. She has to develop the ability to find enjoyment and purpose regardless of external circumstances. The best moments usually occur when a person's body or mind is stretched to its limits in a voluntary effort to accomplish something difficult and worthwhile. When we act freely for the sake of the action rather than for the ulterior motives, we learn to become more than what we are. And this is where, again, people talk about flow in the context of like game difficulty and it gets the game challenging. It is really, this is about life, right? Who's writing about this about life, about adulthood, about growing into human beings who are in a free society and learning and growing and developing ourselves. And when we are doing something difficult and worthwhile, stretched with limits in a voluntary effort. And again, this is where it's different from if I... One of the downsides of classes is there's people who don't want to be there. The parents want to be there. They're required to take this in the curriculum. They don't want to be there. I don't want to teach them. Part of preferred about running these clubs when I was at Carnegie Mellon and George Tech and the home team came to have current group. If someone doesn't want to be there, great. Go do something else with your life. God, get the hell out of here. Right? You don't want to be on the soccer team. Don't show up on the soccer field. That's fine. But you're in the wrong place. And that is a requirement that they're doing something they care to be doing. But they'd be able to pursue their interests, the things that are challenging them, the things that do push and challenge them. And that also is just a different kind of puzzle to fix. All right, so we want to spread it out over time. And some of these things structurally, again, there's a difference between even when Make It Stick, though it's a more modern book, isn't post-pandemic in the sense of the world being open to the idea of remote and what that involves. But one reason why things are usually time compressed, whether it's a one week long conference, whether it's a four year long degree, whether it is a boot camp that takes two or three months, is because of the intensity and inconvenience of travel and relocation. If, however, you have an internet connection, which you do because you're watching this video, and you're comfortable using Slack or Discord or uh, maybe occasionally a Zoom call, then you can spread it out. There's no reason why you need to pack it all into the one week you spend in San Francisco or the four years you send in Pittsburgh. Or It's something you can spread out and space out, which means it enables you to have the freedom to do these things alongside sustainably other things you're doing. This is where out of these trade-offs, and it's almost comical to look back at the old numbers that when Bertrand Russell and Alan Henry David Thoreau were talking about numbers and dollars, it's because of inflation for over a century, comical low. But the money numbers have changed so much, but even they were complaining about the prices back then in 1816, 1910 or whatever, right? This is not new problems. This has been the case for so long in modern society. But one answer to it, this is where MTJ, for my brain, finally clicked together. Remembering this picture that, again, I thought was a building, it was a stack of cash, was realizing that online education takes away many of those costs. I had realized that when I was running these college game clubs, I thought of them as free. We didn't even charge dues for those clubs. But they were behind the paywall of a university institution, which meant people had to take not only pay the tuition to be at Georgia Tech or Carnegie Mellon, also the fact that they had to, in many of most cases, quit their day job for four years to take part in that. And because of the internet, because of remote learning, it did not need to be so. And this is part of why I left to start what I do now, which is home team game dev. And you'll find out more about that. Of course, as you've probably seen some of my other videos lately talking about why you're doing games because what you're doing at will customize a different path around which projects, which roles, which things you're doing. But we're not running a studio where we're building games for my sake or anybody else's. We're making things that help serve your goals, whether it's to set up your career, prepare you to make the games that you want to make, or just because you want to learn and have fun and round out your strengths and weaknesses. And it's also why if you've got further questions, again, we have a very weird and unusual model. And it's why it confuses people. So how could it be so much more affordable university, is it cheaper? No, it's better for certain kinds of practical learning, right? It's why, again, from the interviews, people talk about how what gave them the skills they needed, what made them good at the job, what made them better in the interviews was the stuff they did in our college clubs as the same benefits to get from home team game dev. Why you'll see the success stories, success stories relevant to whichever one you click through, you're going to see examples of real people we've helped 
overcome these challenges. Depending on why you're trying to do it, we've had lots of people who come through our pipeline over the years, releasing again nearly 200 games together, who've gotten what they're looking for out of it. Read about those on the site. But if you hop to the FAQ, you'll even see a comparison to how it is and isn't like boot camps, degree programs, because one of our challenges that we have, because we're doing this very unusual approach that maybe for you know, the past century, even some smart people knew was a better way to do it, but just didn't make sense in the world around us. Now it does. Now it can because of technology. But people don't get it because it's very, very new. So one of the things that happens is our challenge is often people look at us, they immediately pigeonhole us wrong, right? They're like, oh, is this video courses? No, but we do have video courses. Oh, is this like a boot camp? No, but we have some of the same practical benefits of boot camps. Is this like a degree? It's definitely not a degree. It has some of the same reasons why people go to university. Just that we had someone join who she was saying that, you know, she was thinking about, gosh, she might, she might go to a master's program for games because she's just trying to find a practical team to work with on this thing that she wants to make. Which, first of all, doesn't even always what happens in those grad programs. But then she realized and talked to me about what home team is and was like, oh, I should do this instead. And now she's doing this instead and leading her project and building it. And that's all going very well. So anyway, you can find out more about us at hometeamgamedev.com. And by the way, if you feel stuck on this question, I want to also throw out there is one last other plug. Scroll to the bottom. Take this quiz. Includes a gift. You can also get it from whygamedev.com. But it's a simple survey of eight questions. To make it kind of fun. It's set up like a fantasy, you know, class quiz. Should you be an archer, stealth, or mage? Archer, stealth, or warrior? Um, based on your answers to this quiz about why are you really making games. It'll help give you the score in your email, including a gift from my backlog of content about trying to make it as, as a business, just to build your own games, uh, just to try to learn the fundamentals and have fun and gain some practical fluency. You'll get different material from me. That's all paid content. Normally, we're $40 or more completely free based on your answer to this survey and quiz. If you choose to do that, that's available at the bottom of hometeamgamedev.com, hometeamgamedev.com. Anyway, that's it. That's why I teach the way that I teach. That's why it's so important to me. Normally, again, there's reasons why this doesn't quite fit into the way that university classrooms and things work. I may try to experiment with adapting this as best as I can into how this fits into graded curriculum and stuff, but I got a lot to figure out for that. Uh, I just figured out a couple of hours ago that I might be back for one class this coming semester at Northeastern, and uh, we'll see if I can make this work. It's going to be a weird experiment, but I'm going to teach the way I know how to teach, and this is the way I know how to teach because I've been doing it for 20 years. Anyway, that's it. Catch all around. Perhaps I'll see you in Home Team Game Dev. Regardless of what you decide, hopefully this spoke to you and your understanding of why and how, if learning didn't feel right, don't even blame yourself. Consider the possibility that the way that you were being taught wasn't really a fit for the better way to be learning, and the world has not quite caught up yet to the better way for teaching and learning to fit in a modern context where you have technology, where you can spread things out, where you don't need to relocate or quit the day job. There are better and new ways to learn. That's it for now. I'll catch you next time. Keep making games.